Yeah, what we do is heat up the pemmican in the pan, half the butter, half the butter in there, slice the cheese up, put that in there, probably about half I think, and we're going to add half the sugar to give us a bit more energy and give it a, a slightly sweeter flavour. Yeah. How's your looking, Ad? Oh, bubbling away nicely. I think it's now time to add the uh, biscuits to the uh, concoction, just to thicken it up a bit. It's about time I eat some of that food, I think. I think so, keep filming. No, no, no. As you Adam. can see, myself and Jason, jobs are good, all gone. Uh, that was completely full, and uh, I think it did the trick because we're both quite uh, toppers now, and uh, looking forward to a quick cup of tea uh, before we insert ourselves into our bags for the next ooh, 12 hours. 12 hours. <laughs> Happy with that. <laughs> The plan for our grouse team today is to shuttle everything to a hut 20 kilometers away. They're leaving Lake Songa, where they landed, and they're crossing into a valley that will lead them to the target. This is a punishing climb, but it's one they'll have to do twice as they return for the rest of their kit. But as the original team reached here, they had an amazing stroke of luck. That's a really curious story. I as a boy at the Rukan, I had a small sledge, and during the war it disappeared. And of all places, I found my own sledge at, uh, in a hut in the Songa Valley. Probably the sledge had been stolen from him <laughs> before the war, and now he found, he found the sledge, and that helped us much. Then we could put the um, accumulator on the sledge and all the heavy equipment and also most of um, what was in the, uh, the rucksacks. So we didn't have so much to carry on our back. You've just seen that little fellow over there, which will hopefully make the rest of the day quite easy. Well, easier anyway. Yep. This simple discovery probably saved the original mission from disaster. As the team head back for the rest of their kit, they know from now on they'll be able to carry everything in one go, effectively cutting the distance they have to cover by two thirds. When you know every kilometre you you've uh, skied is one more in the bag and it's out of the way, it definitely boosts your morale and gives you something to aim for. You haven't got that sort of constant feeling of, oh, I've done this and now I'm going to go back again. You can concentrate on the, uh, the job and the mission at hand. We catch up with them again six hours later. And like the original grouse team before them, they can now look forward to their first night in a hut. Hi guys. Bloody, this is luxury, isn't it? I don't know. Well, how's it going? Yeah, not bad. Yeah, I'm glad to, to end up in a hut anyway. The past couple of days have been particularly cold probably around about minus 20 at night. So imagine in the hut we're going to be at least in the plus. <laughs> and you save a lot of energy because you don't have to use a lot of energy keeping yourself warm all the door. And uh, you can dry your clothes a bit at least. So it means a lot to be inside out. Well, as you can see, hut ad nighttime administration. In the kitchen, you have Thomas, he's making drinks for everyone in his very nice underwear. And if I spin around past Jason, you see hanging up are all the sleeping bags drying out prior to us getting in there tonight and having a good night's sleep.
Today, our team will be traveling through this valley and crossing the frozen lake Bitdal. Crossing frozen lakes can save you plenty of time and energy, but it can also be extremely dangerous. On one occasion, Jens Anton Poulsen fell through the ice and had to be rescued by his colleagues. This is something that all soldiers working in this sort of environment train for regularly, so that they don't panic if it does happen. If they are going to be travelling across ice, there are a few preparations they make. Firstly, they make sure that their ski binding is loose, so they're not trapped in it should they break through ice. And secondly, their hands are free of the loops on their ski poles. A layer of ice is already forming on the hole we've dug out. The water itself is just above freezing and the air temperature is minus 18 with a cutting wind. Prebens volunteered to show how to deal with such an emergency. He's on safety ropes and there's a heated tent ready, but if you were out here on your own, you would have seconds to act correctly before you started to freeze to death. OK, Prem, over to you. You'll see, he'll use his ski poles to get out. And he's coming back to the side that he broke through on, because here he knows that the ice will support his weight. If he was to keep going forwards, the ice could be getting thinner. See how he uses the poles? So he can get out unassisted. Excellent. On the thermal camera, you can see that before Preben went into the water, his heat loss was restricted to his uncovered face. But once he's got out, you can clearly see the difference. Because he's wet, he's now losing heat 25 times faster than the rest of us. So he's lit up like a Christmas tree. He's already on the slippery slope that could end in death from hypothermia. Uh, rather cold. Don't try this at home. Without a heated tent, Preben would have to strip down and put on dry clothes as fast as possible. That's why when you travel here, you should always carry a ditch kit, an emergency pack full of spare clothing, a tent and a sleeping bag, the bare minimum to make an incident like this survivable. Without that, Poulsen might not have survived going through the ice, especially as he and his men had few energy reserves. Once we've thawed Preben out, our team moves on across Lake Bitdal. Their final destination is the hut that the original team made their base while they waited for the glider party to arrive. The steep sides of the valley funnel wind across the lake at terrific speeds and there's little direct sunlight to warm the body. A long uphill climb at the point that they leave the lake makes this one of the toughest challenges to date. Although they've only been going for three days, the lack of food is starting to tell. You work a lot slower and you have to be, try to be conscious about that because if you try to work fast on a too little rations, it empties you uh, within hours actually. Yeah. So by the second week of their trek, the original grouse team were really struggling. They were often only managing two or three kilometers a day, but they had to press on to make their rendezvous on the next full moon. Finally, though, after 18 days, the team arrived at this hut within striking distance of their target. It had taken forever. For the first three days, they'd been pinned down by the most appalling weather, and the journey, which should have taken a week, actually took 15 days all achieved with hardly any food. This hut was well chosen. It was close to the lake where the gliders would land, but far enough from the factory to avoid raising suspicion. Because of problems with their antenna, they'd failed to make radio contact with London since landing. They desperately needed to announce that the mission was still on. Inside, they found several bamboo fishing poles, which they lash together to make a makeshift aerial mast. I got hold of three or four, four of them, I think, put them together and got a high antenna and then I got um, connection right away, first class. <laughs> 